customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you are a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Have you heard about our newest book? The Employee Experience Revolution, written by John DeJulius and Dave Murray. It's all about everything businesses need to succeed these days. How to increase morale, retain your workforce, and drive business growth. Order your copy today at thedejuliusgroup.com and receive a limited time bonus. 15 pages of interview questions designed to gauge an applicant's service aptitude potential. Get your copy today. Welcome, revolutionaries, to the Customer Service Revolution podcast. I am John DeJulius, Chief Revolution Officer of the DeJulius Group. On today's episode, I interview Bob King. Bob literally wrote the book on closing, The Joy of Closing, The Definitive Guide to Building Trust, Getting a Deal, and Creating Happy Customers. Before we get into our interview, let's talk about what's happening in customer experience. How one company reduce non-revenue calls and reduce payroll due to increased call volume. One of our e-commerce clients was just about to add more customer service reps and payroll to their current call contact center schedule. However, when we broke down the reasons for their calls, we found that a significant number of customers were non-revenue calls. Customers calling to place orders is revenue, but rather these callers, a percentage of them were complaining about service defects that they couldn't resolve online. The first issue was that when customers purchase a product online, the order would default to a monthly subscription and it was not obvious to the customer. They wouldn't be informed of it until another order showed up the following month and their credit card was billed. This resulted in the second issue. Customers could not cancel their subscriptions online. The third major reason customers were calling was that the company's next day air option failed to explain that if a customer ordered a product after 4 p.m., it wouldn't arrive the next day. All these service defects were easy fixes on their website, reducing over 25% of their call volume. 25% of non-revenue calls, eliminating the need to add more CSR staff and increase payroll. Even better, there was a dramatic decrease in customer complaints resulting in not only customers being happier, but resulting in higher employee morale. Understanding why customers call is crucial for improving customer service, enhancing product offerings, and increasing overall customer satisfaction. It can also make your customer service reps more revenue efficient and keep your contact center's payroll under control. A vital report to commonly review is a breakdown of why customers are calling. At the end of the day, all calls can be placed into two primary categories. One, revenue calls, or two, non-revenue calls. The key is reducing non-revenue calls by eliminating service defects on your website and make it simple and easy for customers to get their questions answered without calling your organization. We'll be right back after this with our interview. Are you still guessing at ways to improve your customer satisfaction scores or how to hire and keep the best talent? Stop guessing and become knowledgeable. Join the Customer Experience Executive Academy and learn what the world-class companies already know. At the Customer Experience Executive Academy, you'll learn the methodology applied by world-class companies to create consistent, memorable moments that lead to happy customers and happy employees. 
visit cxea.org or contact Claudia at thedejuliusgroup.com for more information on how to enroll. Welcome back, revolutionaries. And today I am talking to Bob King, who literally wrote the book on closing. It's called The Joy of Closing, The Definitive Guide to Building Trust, Getting a Deal, and Creating Happy Customers. Welcome, Bob. Thanks for having me. Uh, It's a pleasure. Uh, So, Bob, tell our audience a little bit about your background and how you got here. Sure. I was a filmmaker. I worked in the film business for about 19 years. Had a little success, made a couple of movies, sold a couple of scripts, but never really found a way to make money. And then this thing came along called the global economic collapse. I don't know if you heard of it back in 2007 through 2009. And I kind of lost the ancillary income that kept me afloat. And I had to find a way to make money. And I took a job in sales because I wanted to know how a guy sells you a blender on a day you never thought about blenders. That was for a solar power company. And when I went to the job interview, I could kind of tell that there was something. I just, I knew there was something for me to learn from this guy, but I also knew that it was probably tricking the customer and it was, and uh, I was fascinated by it. But also what I quickly discovered is how to earn a customer's business on the first day and all the ways I had destroyed any chance of that happening back when I was making movies. And so it, it, even though I was kind of working for scoundrels and tricking customers to go forward based on their greed, I learned all these skills about building trust with customers and, and how to earn their business and how to bring clarity to their chaos through a streamlined presentation that later in my career, and you know, I, wasn't, I was only there a couple of months, and then I went to a, another company that was a little better, and then I went to a solar startup where my job was to build a sales team and train people how to close. And if you want to learn something, practice it. If you want to master it, teach it. I became a master at closing by teaching other people how to do it and eventually wound up at a very reputable company where customers were never going to regret the decision they made that day. And so it's been a long journey, but lots of insights along the way that I then put into my book, The Joy of Closing, The Definitive Guide to Building Trust, Getting the Deal, and Creating Happy Customers. So I'm assuming, probably not knowing or subconsciously, your background in filmmaking prepared you for selling and closing. Is that that safe to say? I think if I had understood what I understand now, or what I came to understand through the process of learning how to earn a customer's business and build that trust, I don't think I ever would have had a career in sales because I would have been able to get hired as a filmmaker And instead of sabotaging those initial first meetings and picking fights and doing all the things that I, you know, wish I'd learned how to do, (laughs) I think I, I probably would have been more successful and maybe never done the career that I wound up doing over the last 15 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and let me ask you this, in your experience, are great sales people born or can they be trained? That's a good question. I believe they can be trained because I've trained, I've taken a lot of sales. Well, I make a distinction between a salesperson and a closer. I think you're saying great salespeople and what you really mean is closer. Yeah, yeah. I guess you're you're not a salesperson if you don't close. No, you are. Most salespeople are salespeople. Okay. And they're really good at presenting, but they don't really know how to work with the customer's resistance to get them something they want. Sure. Closers are willing to go there with their customer and not waste their time and work with their resistance. And the reason I wrote this book is because when I learned how to do that, I realized I was bringing great value to my customers. I wasn't tricking them to get something that they didn't want. I was getting them something they want in a way that was of service to them. And all the other books on closing that I'd ever seen or even heard about were basically, you know, stare at the Ferrari you want to buy until you make this person do something or some version of that. And that's so not my, that was what I was trained in and not what I learned how to do as a result of, you know, whatever, learning how to really be of service to my customers. And and I like when you say of service, because to me, sales is a, is, is kind of a dirty word. 
You know, it's, it, I feel like it's the stereotype, right? Selling. It means if you're selling me, I feel like you're manipulating me versus I like to use, and, and I'm certainly no expert in this area, but I like to use and tell me if you think I'm on the right track, educate versus sell, right? And and sometimes that may mean not take, you know, you're saying, you know, going in different directions because this isn't the best situation for you. Am I on the right track? Yes. I think that you kind of brought up two different things, but let me deal with the yeah. first one first. I mean, educating a customer is just a way of fascinating them. And you really do need to fascinate your customer yeah. um, in order to get their attention and also keep their interest and provide value. I mean, you really do have the, 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 the price of admission on a good sales presentation is being fascinating. And part of that is educating them and, and allowing them to have all the information they need to make a, an informed decision. And sometimes the informed decision is this isn't right for me. That's a possibility. But but the issue there is trust is, am I looking to win the customer's business or earn their trust? Am I looking to make them like me or trust me? Well, you know, I don't care if they like me. It's nice if they like me. But really, most important thing for me is that the customer trusts me because people will buy from someone they don't like, but they will never buy from someone they don't trust. The distinction, I mean, I, I think sales, well, I've called my book the joy of closing and not the joy of sales, because I want to, I mean, I actually think there's a lot of books on sales that are kind of interesting and really talk about a lot of psychology and how to present things in a way that doesn't invoke, make the customer get their guard up by coming across yeah. as salesy, yeah, yeah. right? But but salesy is nowhere near as stigmatized as closing e if that were a word. And I like to go right into the, you know, belly of the beast and say, no, closing you know, being that person, because a sale, a closer is an agent of change, right? And that customer came to you because there's something in them that they, that they want to change. And if you have the right solution for them, it does not do them any favors to give them a bunch of information about how great your solution is and not be willing to work with their resistance to close them. Because if you don't do that, you're actually leaving that customer to the wolves of some person that's better at closing than you are that may have an inferior product or a worse price, but they have the, the commitment and it really requires commitment to stay with that customer, work with their resistance and get it for them. And learning how to do that is really important and the best way to be of service to your customer, to your company and to your, to you. So I, I assume, you know, the closing, it has to be starts way before to get there right so so if if it's a, you know a, a, we may call it a discovery but whatever the initial call is i reach out to you my business reach outs to you and says hey we're interested in and 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 whatever you know it is that your company i'm not necessarily talking about bob but someone who you coach consult we're interested in in you know inquiring about your services and products where does the trust, what, what should be the first thing you do to uncommoditize, I believe, both you as the salesperson, your brand, and what you're selling? So you do need to have an effective presentation that can bring clarity to their chaos yeah. and, you know, make them be certain that this is the right path for them. And, and I, the funny thing is I have the benefit of having been, you know, my first sales job, if I didn't sell that deal, some manager would come behind me with a massive price drop and get it, get it out. And I would yeah. make nothing. Okay. <laughs> Except they paid my gas and literally I had to send in the receipts. It was a nightmare. And so that meant I had to come up with an effective presentation that would make them want it and then find a way to close them. And the methods, you know, I'm not advocating the methods that that company had us use. Right. All right. And I have a whole way of replacing all that that I go to in the book, but it basically stems from belief and really starting with the the idea that moving forward today is the very best thing for your customer, your company, and for you. And when you have that mindset, even if it's a business where you're not necessarily going to close them on that day, you're at least yeah. going to make the absolute best presentation. You're going to make them decide to do business with you that day, right? And that's the most important thing that you can accomplish. So when you're in that situation, you know, you don't have a choice of like, okay, well, you know, I'll give it a light touch and then I'll come back and kill him, you know, tomorrow with how great this is going to be. You really have one chance, but this is true in any sales situation. You only have the element of surprise one time. There's only one moment when that customer, when everything that customer knows about 
your product and you and your company, you know, is dependent on what you're presenting. And that's when you make that first initial call. So it's really, really important. I do go through a, a process I call One Call Magic, uh, <laughs> to, uh, and it's it's a streamlined version of One Call Close. And I've found, especially B2B customers or B2B clients, it's amazing. A lot of them don't even have a pitch, you know, or or they have a pitch, but they don't, it's not very well crafted. You know, it's like, well, I ask a lot of discovery questions. And right. then whatever happens next, they, they think they're improv but what they're really doing is trying to think of what to say when they should know what they're saying about their company, about their product, about the why, the reasons why people use their product in order to create that desire in the customer and make them feel the pain of their current situation. You know, if you're figuring that out every time based on the customer, you're working way too hard and you're not really paying attention to what they're reacting to in order to streamline your pitch, again, to get them what they want. So one of the things that we help our clients with, and that obviously is important, is making price irrelevant, right? And, and we don't want to, you know, our go. clients don't want to be the lowest <laughs> bidder, yes. right? So, so <laughs> I, you know, what's that look like on the first call? How are you building trust? How are you developing these things where I, if I have, if I had a call right before with another salesperson right. selling the same product and I have two other calls later because my boss told me I need to get four vendors to pitch this. Okay. How, how do you teach your, your clients to stand out? Number one mindset, number one, and it has to come from something real. You can't just manufacture the idea that you're that customer's best option. You figure out the ways that that's true and you know, different companies, it's going to be different reasons. But there has to be some reason why going forward with your company is better than going forward with any other company or any other product. And you need to tap into that, believe in it, focus on that before you ever talk to your customer, make sure you're clear on all, on what that is. Then when you first encounter the customer, you want to pay attention to them. That's something that especially novice salespeople but and young people in general don't do. They just don't figure out who they're with. They don't pay them. A, the first exercise in my book is pay three sincere compliments. So one to a total stranger, one to someone you work with or see every day, one to someone you live with. And just the act of paying a sincere compliment transforms any interaction between two people. Because, and for you as well as whoever you're talking to, finding a sincere way to appreciate another person's creative expression is and a, a spiritual experience every time. And, and so I always start with that. And then, you know, you're going to do some discovery, but beyond discovery is just who's this human being? Who am I with? Who am I spending time with? A lot of sales jobs are commission only. And if I show up at someone's house or wherever I'm meeting them, you know, spend time with this person and, uh, you know, don't get a deal, either I got something out of it because I got to meet another human being or I'm out gas money and time. I don't like wasting time. So I think it's important to get to know another human being. And so that would be the, the second thing is pay attention to that person and engage with them and get to know them on a human level. And the, that's the biggest thing missing from most, especially B2B. And, the, and it doesn't have to be like a long delve into, you know, you're not their psychologist, but just be a decent person that's paying attention to where they're coming from and what's important to them. So you understand that. And then the next thing, which is probably more of what your question was, is you need to make them feel the pain of their current situation. The first thing you need to do is attack the status quo. If you are an agent of change, you need to make them want to change. And so whatever it is they're doing now, you need to find a way to make them feel the pain of. And I have ways to do that in the book. My primary contribution to the world of sales is something called the three reasons. And that is, you know, the three, so you'll say to the customer, there's three main reasons why people put their home up uh, uh, for short-term rentals. Number one reason is money, right? And then you're going to talk about the financial advantages of short-term versus long-term rentals or, you know, think, or doing it on their own. The second reason is always feels good. And I'm just using that as an example, right? Yeah. It could be any product. Second, there's always a feel-good reason to any product. Either you enjoy using it or it's good for the environment or it makes you feel good or makes you look good. There's always some... And that is really important to talk about. That's another thing that people really don't focus on. People buy things because of whatever small, stupid reason. 
And so when you do a sales pitch, you want to put as many small, stupid reasons for doing this today as you possibly can, because you don't know what it is that makes a customer go forward. And by the way, neither do they. There's just one, maybe they liked how you pet their dog. <laughs> they really might be it. Or that you called attention to their favorite painting that they just spent a lot of money for and said how much you you you, you enjoyed it or you appreciated it. Or you just ask them, wow, that's a remarkable piece of art. You know, where did that come from? And they'll tell you a story. And next thing you know, they like you. Yeah. And 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 not not because you like did something to get a sale. It's because there was another human being with you, and you paid attention to them. That it's I call it a small stupid reason, but it's actually a really important reason. But anyway, the second reason is feel good. The third reason is always timing, and that is a great opportunity to create urgency without saying do this now because it's on sale. You talk about the reasons why going forward today is to the advantage of any customer going forward with whatever it is you're proposing. You know, whatever. If you're selling a watch, this is a very, you know, there's going to be a festival in somewhere next week that's going to raise the price of this commodity. You know, whatever it is, there's always a good reason, hopefully more than one, for going forward right away versus waiting. And you want to call their attention to that as why other people are doing it, not why they should do it, so that going forward today becomes their idea, not something you're trying to make them do. So that's that's the feel the pain part. Yeah. There's a whole chapter about it. It's a whole step, but that's that's a taste of it. If you enjoy what you're learning on the Customer Service Revolution podcast, you'll love our weekly newsletter, The E-Service. It's full of great customer experience tips and stories, includes special offers, webinars, and more each week. To sign up, head to tdg.click forward slash e-service. That's tdg.click, C-L-I-C-K forward slash e-service. E-S-E-R-V-I-C-E. Enter your preferred email address and you can look forward to great advice from John in your inbox every Wednesday. So Bob, how do you answer this? You quote me or how do you train salespeople for this? You know, the salesperson quoted me and then I respond with, well, I can get that five, 10% less with ABC. So closing, the actual act of closing like as a step in a sales process is everything that happens after you present price, right? right. A sales call is a strip tease towards price. And you do not show them what your goods until the money's in your G-string, okay? So by the time they're arguing over price, you have made a clear and effective presentation. You've told them about your company. You've told them about your product. You've made them want their product. You've, you, you, you've made them feel the pain of your, their current situation and the pleasure of your solution. And you've shown them all the reasons why people go forward and why going forward today is better than waiting. And so they want your product. And the only thing standing in the way of a sale probably is price. And so you present your price. You stop talking. And if their objection is, you know, I could get it cheaper, that's like an NFL receiver getting their hands on a football. You are expected to make the <laughs> make the catch and hopefully get a touchdown. So if they're only objecting this price, that's probably the easiest thing to deal with. And there's different responses to it. Maybe you left enough money. Maybe it's the first response they have. You, you, your first price is probably got a lot of money left in the deal. And you might say, well, you know, is if you want to narrow it down. You say, so other than price, is there any reason we're not doing this today? And if the answer is yes, you know, I think we all know, you, you know, you're either a price drop or a restatement of your value proposition away from getting the business. And that depends on A, where your price is when they say it, and B, whether or not it's going to work, you know, to just to not drop your price. But yeah, if the, if that's the easiest objection. Two questions here. I don't think they're the same, but you tell me. When looking for a great sales candidate, mm -hmm. what skills do we want to find? And then when we're training, it, it may be the same answer. What skill, I'm sure some skills you can't train for. Like I believe that there's a lot of things you can train for, but like love of, of people. I don't think all the training in the world, if you just don't like people, I'm not, I can't put you through enough classes and training hours to get you to like people. 
So that's just one example. But what what skill set should people look for when hiring a sales candidate? And what skill set, if it's different, should they be training them on? I'm going to challenge you a little bit about that because I actually think that when you invite someone to like people, they are, I'm not saying that's necessarily the best person to hire, but you know, I'm not working with people. I'm not telling people who to hire. I'm working with what I got. Right. And you would be shocked how often just inviting someone to step out of their, whatever it is that makes them think they don't like people um allows them to suddenly like people like it's a weird thing that if you just call attention to something and give them a different course most people if they trust you will give it a try and liking people versus not liking people or really i think what we're both talking about is taking an interest in another human being when that's not in your skill set is a drug that is so delicious that it's kind of like, you know, heroin, like the first time you do it, you're an addict. And I I challenge you, especially on that quality specifically, I I think most of the time someone just needs to say to them, you know, before you start talking about all the stuff you want to sell them, take a moment, be in the room with the person that you're with or the zoom or whatever, however it is you're interacting and just take an interest. I'm not saying ask questions about themselves. I'm saying in your brain, take an interest in that other human being and try and understand their needs. Or, or their wants, or whether or not you went to the same college, you know, just a moment to pay attention to that person will transform the experience of a sale from what can I get from you to who can I be for you. And when you come and when, and when someone's invited into doing that, it does really change their lives. It's probably the best thing about coaching people is that the, the skills that I ask them to bring to a sale really do make their whole life better. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And obviously these these sales skills don't apply just for the sales team. I mean, you know, I believe they apply to the human resource who's who's doing recruiting. They're selling you the potential employee on the brand. The CEO is trying to sell and rally his 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 whole organization around his vision and uh, how the the company is going to be different than everyone else. Can I tell you how true that is? It's so crazy. So I uh, now have, you know, coached a number of sales teams. And one thing that recently came to me, so I I, I, I was working with the sales team and we were, I don't want to get, I can't get too into the details of what I was coaching them on, but it was a whole sales team changing their approach to their partners. And it was being adopted a little more cautiously than what I, and and the reason it was being adopted cautiously is they were not embracing the part of the pitch they have that requires them to go after the status quo of what their partners are doing in order to embrace the change that represents using their product, you know, they're a vendor versus what they're using now, which is their product's more expensive, right? And I realized that in order to inspire the sales team to attack the status quo of their partners, you know, which are salespeople who are, they want them to like them, right? The only way I could do that was to, as a coach or as a sales consultant in this case, attack the status quo of how they were approaching the partners and show them how that approach, if they didn't create the pain of what they're doing now. So I had to create the pain of what the sales team was doing now or the RSMs in order to make them, inspire them to be willing to attack the pain of their partners or their clients, technically, I mean, to me, they're their customers, but but they're, you know, this is a B2B situation, a very B2B, like third, you know, B2B, which the B has a C, if that's enough house of mirrors for you. Yeah. And, and so it's not just that I have to tell people to do it, I have to be willing to do it. And I, and, and can I tell you, I went there, I did it, and it has turned that team around. They are embracing this stuff. They're having victories in a way that I couldn't have even imagined possible. It's really exciting. But it took me being willing to attack their status quo in order to inspire them to attack the status quo of their B2B customer. 
Love it. We are talking to Bob King, author of The Joy of Closing, The Definitive Guide to Building Trust, Getting the Deal, and Creating Happy Customers. Bob, where can people get your book and follow you and, and all that that we can put in their show notes? My book is on Amazon. There's also a Kindle and an audio book, which I recorded. My website's joyofclosing.com. I'm also on TikTok at the Joyful Closer or just Joyful Closer at Joyful Closer and Bob King 3400 on Instagram. And we will put all those in the show notes. Bob, what's the last thing you'd like to leave our listeners with? Everyone is a closer, right? Everyone has picked the book for their book club or the movie on a Saturday night. If you've ever gotten your kid to clean their room or their plate or go to college, you have successfully closed someone. Everyone also needs to be closed. There is nothing, the only thing more satisfying than getting what we want and knowing it is helping someone else do that. And so the book that I wrote seeks to take a part of the sales process that even many seasoned professionals somehow find beneath them or awkward and really reveal its value to the customer, to your company, and also to you. And that's why I wrote this book, because the things I learned in terms of how to close a deal made my whole life better. And I really wanted to open up that opportunity as well as just the mindset that allows that to happen to a large number of people and take closing from this very stigmatized thing to something that is incredibly valuable and that someone who's doing it can feel really good about. And so that was the purpose of my book. And it's something we do in real life as well as at the sales table. And I want people to feel good about that too, because most of the time you're just working with someone's resistance to get them something they want. And that's kind of our highest calling as human beings. And so, you know, I wanted someone to, I wanted a way for, you know, that to be part of, of what happens in life and what happens in sales and to make this a beautiful and joyful process for others as it has been for me. I love it. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. I know my uh, listeners got a lot of value out of this. Enjoy, you know, the the holiday weekend that we have coming up, which this podcast will probably fall a couple weeks after 4th of July. But I, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Have a great day, John. Thanks, Revolutionaries. We'll be right back after this. Let's wrap up this episode with my mantra, living an extraordinary life so countless others do. Leading in a crisis, every company leader and human being will face multiple crises in their life, whether it's a recession, pandemic, or just a challenging circumstances related specifically to your industry, company, or life. How a leader leads during a crisis will be their narrative and how they're remembered. In times of adversity and change, we discover who we are and what we're made of. You can't pick and choose when you want to lead. We didn't choose to become a leader because it was always going to be easy. We wanted to be that person others could count on to take control, who could handle and navigate through any situation, no matter its size. When a crisis occurs, that is the time to step up. Our employees are counting on us. They believe in us. Leadership is easy when the wind is at our back, but much harder when we are facing into the headwinds. It's imperative to confidently show all our employees and family members that this crisis is temporary and will pass. We need to appreciate the anxiety and stress every employee, fellow leader, vendor, and customers may be having during difficult times. Morale is bound to be low, and we need to be at our best to reduce any fear and anxiety. Crisis defines leadership. I personally have found that I am at my best when my companies and I are being challenged or fighting for survival. In a strange way, I'm actually comfortable with and become more energized by the obstacles we are facing. This is my nature. While others are panicking and making short-sighted decisions, my confident level increases. I act like I've been waiting for this day, that I knew it was coming, and I'm poised and ready for it. I want everyone in my companies to feel that they are in the best place they could be. This 
will be our finest moments. Thanks for joining us on this week's Customer Service Revolution podcast.